interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> one, one of the things I wanted to, and so we made, oh, there's the star that we've been waiting yes. for. Yay, give a round of applause. Francis, Oh. Francis, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Good. And we're about to see Hello, you. Can you... About yes. to see the man. Hello. Oh, there he is. oh wow. You look so yes. casual. Wow. Oh, I should have. Wow. This is going to be a big party. <laughs> so yeah. let me uh introduce uh, Francis Howard, about to defend his PhD in physics. Is that correct? Is it uh, physics? Math mathematical physics. Mathematical physics. And um, he gave the first uh, inaugural distinguished lecture for Math for Wisdom. We are now having the after party talk. Uh, I am Andres Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Our wonderful uh, friends and guests are John Harland, a PhD in math in California, Jerry Northrup, PhD in biophysics in uh, Western New York, and Ryan Buchanan, a genius in uh, Oregon, young genius uh, in uh, Oregon. So please, um, let's party. All right. <laughs> nice to meet you, Francis. Nice to meet you too, yes. Ralph. Yes. So I listened to I listened okay. to your talk. I listened to your talk last night, yes. and um, I think my percentage of understanding was lower than Andrews's. Uh, he mm -hmm. said he was close to forty five percent. I might have been. I might have been more like 25. But, okay. Uh, it is okay. It's very interesting. And I do have That's questions. Great. I do have oh, questions. Oh, okay. we were just as we great. were waiting for Francis, uh, we got to talk with Jerry Northrup. He's a huge asset to our laboratory because of his uh, understanding of vast domains of biology, his uh, okay. philosophical work building on that. And uh, the what I just wanted to say as a topic before I forgot is that John is uh, has a passion for physics and has this okay. instinct that the laws of physics should be derivable by some kind of evolutionary culling process. So this whole idea of like how would that work that may be a theme of one of the themes of our party. So that that great that's great that's great. I also did listen to the talk um, you gave on the SU two and the discussion you had. Yeah. with uh, Prof. John, I listened. It, it is, it's very great and interesting. And I, I could understand the way uh, you, you were thinking and how you want things to be processed here yeah, individually uh, with the SU2 and the links to the Dirac and the dynamical systems, as well as uh, the connection with uh, nature and looking at it in, with a seven um, um, sections that you described in philosophical way mm -hmm. that 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 is great that is mm -hmm. great well thanks thanks for listening to that so how would you like us would you like us to start with the questions well i think we start with um uh your talk maybe comments uh questions uh and okay. then we can Take tangents. Uh, so, who would like to ask Francis okay. a question or give a comment? So, I've, I've got a question. Um, so, Francis, you made a you made a, a claim at the end of the talk that gravity um, had a the gravitational field had SU five symmetry, and that's that's in accordance with your framework, right? Because that's not normally yes. the symmetry that's accorded to gravity. Is that, am I correct there? Okay. Um, to my best understanding, with the symmetry that um, gravity, the graviton has a spin of two. And um, I have been able to look at a way that we link this, um, the spin of a particle to the Dinkins root system. And according to the Dinkins root system, the spin of two would be um, would be linked or connected to the SU5 according to the spin system that I, I derived for a particle. So if we have a spin half, a spin half maps into an SU2 or an SL2C, which is a special linear order, a special linear group of order two. And when we have a 
boson that is a spin zero a spin zero maps into the so1 which is also the sl1c which is special linear order of order one so in my in my paper which was published in springer we were able to show that these particles that is fermions and bosons have connections with the Dinkins root that is the classical system that's the bn and the dn the structure of those two groups so any particle at all can be linked to that two groups it should it can either be a Dinkin root of bn or a Dinkins root of dn which is very true but in a in a bigger spectrum i have Notice that all the particles that that will come to the top when I really meet for the SU2, all the particles in nature placed around the Hamiltonian. Because I noticed that after a little research I did on Klepsch Gordon, and the, the paper is yet to be out soon, but I noticed every particle is just behaving Hamiltonian and symplectic in nature. Yes. So, so this uh, link between gravity and SU5 is a new, that, that's kind of a new way of looking at it, right? This is not a... Yes, that, yes, that, that spin two. We know that graviton has a spin of two, according to the LIGO research that was done, I think some few years back. They noticed that the graviton has, when they were researching into the black hole, they noticed the graviton has a spin of two. And the spin of two, in my in the in my dad spin two maps into the SL um, 2n plus one so 2n plus one when the n is a two we have SL to SL5 and the SL5 is in the unitary SU2 uh, SU5 group the SL5 can be found in the unitary special unitary SU5 group that is why I connected the spin two to the SU5. And so is, from is that, the- Oh, I'm sorry, is that SL5 over the reals or complexes? The SL5 is over the complexes. Okay. We can do, uh, we can do a, 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 a complexification so that we get the compact real form of that. And obviously the compact real form of that would be still an SU5. SU5, right, okay. According to- according to um, Catan decomposition. And maybe just to add, um, if we look at the Dinkin diagrams, like SU2 would be the first node all by itself. Yes. This is a building block. That's why we're so excited about SU2. But then yes. SU3 would be two nodes connected yes. by a link. The link geometrically would be 120 degrees. SU4 yes. would be three nodes connected by 120 notes, degrees yes. and 120 degrees. And we made a whole video yes. explaining basically that when you have SU4, um, the outer, you know, you get 120 degrees plus 120 degrees equals 90 degrees. Like the outer Absolutely. things are independent. Yes. So that we had a video yes. explaining this. And then SU5 yes. is putting it one more. Now you have four nodes with three things. And so like in three our things. philosophy, like, you know, so you have these four, like in Jerry's, uh, a philosophical approach, uh, this foursome, you know, this hierarchy yes. of four things, that's would be involved in SU5. Uh, it's sitting there, you know, that's now right. we have to interpret what that means, but it's, it's it's available for our philosophical consumption. That, that is true. That is true. But I, I basically argue that the standard model, I from the unitary point of view it is true that it has been predicted i try to look at the origin of the standard model and i haven't yet gotten a solution to that i wanted to know how they came about with the su5 su3 su2 and the u1 i have tried i've understood it from the electromagnetism points the maxwell's equation i've also looked at the gelman matrices and the Pauli matrices but uh, to get the real or origin of the SU5, how they brought that model into being. I haven't been able to locate that yet. And so is that a, that's I'm an established to... that's an established fact that uh, SU3 yes. times SU2 times U of one equals yes. is isomorphic to SU5. Is that correct? Or... Yes. 
Yes, that is, has been established, but I am still trying to get the origin of the establishment. If I could see an original paper that or experiment mm. that brought about this. Well, my argument is in, in, in the quantum world, we believe everything is a wave. So if the standard model in its natural way is an SU5, what, what would the quantum nature of this behave like? That, that is what I've been thinking for the past years. And I, I want to spend some time with my life uh, looking into that, the, the deformation of the SU5, when the standard model is deformed, how would it be? Would it be the same when the quantum limit approaches one and will we have the original form of SU5 and how would it be? So I am I am also thinking through that for quite a while and researching into that. But that that is still a work in progress. Yes. May I ask Jerry, are you familiar with league theory or not at all or a little bit? Oh uh, I I am a little bit. Again, uh, just for Francis's sake, uh, I'm a biologist. And I work at okay. two different levels. One is experimental biotechnology. So I build big systems that are wastewater treatment plants, manure management, uh, nutrient management plants. Uh, we have about 10,000 hog farms or 1,000 cow dairy, the large municipal wastewater treatment plants. But I'm also a theoretical biologist. I'm very interested okay. in the foundations of life, consciousness, language. And so from that perspective, I've done a, uh, a fair amount of looking at, uh, at mathematics as a subset of language or what I call a hypothetical universal language that would subsume mathematics. Okay. That, so I approach that okay. from a perspective of more topology, set theory, uh, that kind of an approach, abstract algebra. Uh, I am... Uh, reasonably familiar with general relativity. Uh, I don't like tensor. I don't like uh, the, the calculus that, that goes with that type of thing. And I don't like the infinities. So I have conceptual problems of how it relates to personal experience at a, at a biological type of level as to okay. um, how you deal with infinities and, and uh, that sort of stuff, absolute values and how they, they tie back into the construction of the, of the theory. So I'm not familiar with the notation that you use particularly, but uh, I do know what a group is. I know what a Lie algebra is. I have problems okay. with that in terms of once you take a group structure and you add a differential manifold, a differentiable manifold, that seems to me to introduce a lot of of additional baggage in a certain sense from a conceptual level. And so okay. what I'm looking at or, or very interested in the reason I'm, I'm interested, I love quaternions. And I think yes. uh, that, that, that is where it starts and it has a foundational importance for the basic structure of language. So how do you then take that back and say, from the basic structure of language, you could derive quaternions. From quaternions, you get these other kinds of, of uh, structures, and then you add Lie algebra on top of that. And then you end up with problems in, in physics, like you have different mathematical systems for different types of particles. And there's still the problem of what you do with general relativity. Uh, I did spend some time with Mendel Sachs, who had a theory of relativity where he took an, uh, an idea that Einstein has to put it in, in the, use it as a quaternion. So if you use a quaternion algebra on top of a Riemann manifold, he could derive what he thought was, was a lot of, of the things in quantum mechanics. I don't think much happened. He did this in the mid eighties and I don't think it really went anywhere. But the notion of that was that if you could take a quaternion and have it as a geometry instead of an algebra, what would that do? And does that provide a kind of basis when you tie it back to language for the foundations of, of science, physics in general? And I get into this kind of stuff because I see physics as having, it's, it's tremendous. I love, I love physics, I, I like math, but it, it no, doesn't really handle a lot of, of real world life experience. 
and so you know we we have this dichotomy in, in our society at this point where we can talk a lot about these things uh, very very tiny particles huge distances in galaxies but a lot of the basic problems we're facing like climate change i'm a big i focus on that a lot and it doesn't seem that physics can deal with that and I see it as a driver from excessive wealth inequality. Again, you get into social issues, you get into issues of language. And to the extent that the mathematics and quantum mechanics and relativity are a guide to how we adapt language to handle the real world problems, and I think there's tremendous connectivity there for it. I think it, for me, it really starts with a quaternion, but then it gets into these other types of of groups of the kind of work that you're doing. And I was very interested in, in your slides 46 and 47, where the implication was that the language of mathematics is not totally consistent with the language of physics. And that, that, that is an issue I hadn't been aware of particularly, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, Thank you. And also the, the beginning of, of your talk where you were talking with Thomas uh, about what he felt was a typo and, and your explanation yes. of, of why that wasn't the case. And then it's back to the simplifications that physics does to handle certain things like complex conjugation, absolute values, parameterization, uh, and, and what does that do for the foundational basis? And can that be so, the general area where you could start to really rec reconcile gravity or general relativity and quantum mechanics? So, so per perhaps we could look at uh, pages 46 and 47. I mean, in the slides. Okay. I, you can share. Okay. I, I've set you up so you can share your slides. Um, let me, okay. And John, are share. there particular questions that you have or? Well, maybe I want to ask uh, you think about that, but uh, Ryan, what what did you get from the talk? What is your uh... so there was a question that I had, uh, and I forget what slide number it was on, but I like how you link the different um, spin statistics of the different particles, the Higgs, the uh, bosons, and the fermions were linked to zero, z, and z over two respectively. I was wondering if you had thought about how this would work for something like anion. Okay, the anions and scaryons. I've, I have not really dealt into that, but um, I was looking at the broader spectrum where every um, particle, whether it's being lepton, quarks, baryons, um, anions, or scaryons, they will fall exactly under uh, a spin half or an integer spin. So I was just considering the, the foundation of every particle. A particle would either be an, a half integral or an integer. So that is basically what I did. Yes. Okay. I love I your know, shirt uh, so much, Francis. I just have to say, we should have thought about wearing party shirts. Next time, good, good, uh, good call. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Ryan, please. Okay. Oh, you're fine. Okay. Uh, yes. I was just going to say, because I've heard some things about anions, they don't obey the um, spin statistics theorem, or there's some violations mm -hmm. there, they might be pretty weird. And I was wondering mm -hmm. what sort of uh, math we would need to tackle that. Okay, I, I have not really dealt much with the anions. Um, I, I have read a bit of pions and scaryons, but I've not really dealt much with the anions, unless I look at the math structure of, of the, the, the structure of that, the group algebraic structure of that particle and see how they, they violate. Of course, obviously a lot of particles violate the spin statistics and the Bose-Einstein and the Fermi-Dirac operators. They really dis, uh, disobey some of them. But um, I also look at the, the foundation where when all the electromagnetic field and all those um, properties that they obey are being, are being switched off. Like when we take the electromagnetic field of um, an electron, when we switch it off, the particle becomes just an SL2. It behaves like the SU2, SL2. It is no longer an electron. 
So I, I, I consider these particles as um, some sort of mathematical structures with electromagnetic field or with some sort of Planck's constant attached to them. When we look at those constants to be one, we get back the usual mathematics or matrices that we have, yes. Can you show your slides, Francis? Are you able to share the screen? Okay, let me, let me try and see. Dropbox, I think. Drive. Okay, and I think that one. You try. I've been here in Oneonta, New York. Yes, I'm still trying. Lots of activity here, um, but like making an. It looks like I'll mm -hmm. be making an art installation. Uh, we already have um, five people, six people from here. It's a small group of fifteen people. Six of them are now active in math for wisdom you know on the discussion group etc so it's quite yeah, uh, it's great. quite much more activity as well mm -hmm. sounds like you've got a break i guess you can okay okay i guess you could see the slides yes we can see them okay but we're on the very first one right so let me get to let me get to the page 46 where prof talked about so <laughs> Okay, so the page 46, we have um, a spin oh, in mathematics, the crucial. same as yeah. spin J in particle physics, yes, yes. So this, this was where I was looking at the differences between the spin in math and the spin, the spin group in mathematics and the spin particle in physics. A lot of time when we look at the standard model, uh, most scientists when considering the gauge group they they uh, they mostly interchange the language you would notice that the gauge group starts with the su5 then and the su3 su2 and the u1 then all of a sudden it start turning into spins they start talking about spin 10 spin 7 as in john base and I, yes john base and other um, authors researchers have been doing that a lot and when they talk about the spins it goes a bit into more of the mathematics spin group, then all of a sudden it switches to the particles. So I, I, I get a bit worried with these things. And I, I was a bit curious also with how they related. So I decided to delve much into the structure of the spin in, in mathematics, that's in geometry and that of the spin in physics. And I noticed they were completely different using the Dinkins diagram. And in terms of dimensions, obviously they behaved very different, yes. Hmm. Francis, regarding this slide, uh, these are these are the bottom diagrams are commutative diagram, right? These are homo- are, Yes, are they commute. These are homo- Yes, they commute. Right? Yes, and, they commute. So, so what is the- the boson sitting on the, and I think that Andres uh, uh, asked a question kind of uh, mm -hmm. in a similar vein that boson there, um, do, you, do you mean for that to be a, an actual Lie group, um, the, the boson Lie group um, sitting on the lower right hand uh, corner yes. of the commutative diagram? Um, Yes. Uh, like, so I'm not, what, sure what, I'm not sure what boson means there, and if yes, and what what particular? Okay. What I mean, I what I meant was that um, the the commutative diagram SL special linear of order three, the spin one and the SO three, are uh, just the the bosonic uh, form of the Dinkins diagram. So with the boson, I I used the the diagram B. I think BN for the boson. When it comes to the slide, let me check. When we come to this decomposition, okay, so for the SO2, it was linked to the DN, which, which is a fermion. So the boson was, it was linked to the DN, the BN, capital BN. 
So when I mean bosons, I use the preposition, I use this preposition, which is what I mean for bosons. So that is it. Okay, so this is it. I'm trying to get the exact slide. So for bosons, what I mean is that the, the, the particle, the commutative diagram is isomorphic to the root system, the, that's the Dinkins root system, pi of Bn. And for fermions, they are isomorphic or corresponds to the pi of Dn. So when I take the example of the quantum spin being zero half or one, we have the spin zero, the spin half, and the spin one. And these were just the diagrams, but um, being commutative. But the bosons and the fermions, they are just signifying that they, they correspond to the Dinkins root system, BN and DN, uh, respectively, yes. And BN and DN are very much related in the sense that uh, one is a series of uh, even uh, orthogonal groups and the other yes. is odd orthogonal groups odd. so yes i guess is. the spin one half would relate to the odd the fermions would relate to the odd is that correct or i suppose yeah, i mean i'm just guessing the, the the fermion would be with the, the odd ones or not with the fermions um when we say the spin half it it has the connect it is connected it's a connected lead group and it has an odd form and also an even form, depending on how we uh, we connect the gradients, the Z2 gradients. Mm. So in your case, would it be odd or would it be, so which one is BN and which one's DN uh, for the fermions? And the both fermion them? is, the fermion is the, when I looked at this diagram, the fermion is the, the root system DN and the boson is the BN. I think I described oh, so it. Oh, boson is so anytime boson is SO2, boson is the odd one. Is that right? The odd one, yes. Okay. So when the SO two, it's is a little the counterintuitive, but I oh, but I guess you're doing two yes. n plus one. Is that right? This is for fermion, mm -hmm. SO two n, but mm -hmm. for boson is two n plus one. Okay. So that that is it. I wonder why, because fermions have half spin integer spin right yes so why yes. would bosons be 2n plus 1 okay so when we take you speaking of the covering uh, are you speaking of the covering yes, the covering it's a double cover so when we take a particle like spin 1 the spin 1 so we consider n the integer form n to be 1 so if mm -hmm. n is 1 in the general form we would have s L3 because of the N over here, the special linear group of order three and the special um, octagonal group of order three. I think, I, I think to when maybe I'll try to answer my own question. When it's a fermion, yes. N is a half integer, you know, so two times mm -hmm. a half integer will be an even, mm -hmm. even, and then you add one. Yes, absolutely. And so then that's yes. why you get the plus one. Oh, yes. Whereas if it was a uh, yes. boson, then no, then you get even. Wait, I'm sorry. No, two. Uh, oh, I know. When it's a fermion. When it's it a fermion, is, you get an odd Dinkins number group. when you divide it it's by. When. Okay, what happens is let me let me explain into details how I got the structure. Right. So when we take this side, I notice that we look at the mapping, the spin J, the, the Lie algebra. When the odd integer spin are considered, we have the Z over two. Mm -hmm. Now for, that is for fermions. For bosons, it's just integer spins. So we consider every set of positive integers. Now the fraction would be for a fermion will be for in the form two K plus one over two, where K are odd in uh, odd primes, or let me say odd integers. 
So I consider all the odd integers. So mm. when I take k to be zero, I end up with one over two. When k is one, I get um, I get a, a spin one. So every fermion can generate a boson. And it is true in reality. We can add every fermion. We can, we can um, experimentally look at fermions giving us bosons. And even theoretically, it works. I hope, I hope you, get, you get this mapping. For me, everything is a challenge, but this is just, um, you know, bit by bit, like, uh, you know, we're gluing it, you know, we're gluing together see, the, 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 shattered ja the shattered jar, you know, it's, uh, yeah. you're, you're helping. Yeah. The, the particles, let me, let me come a bit clearer. The particles have a specific behavior when mm -hmm. they are integral, half integral spin and integer spin. For all half integral spins, we will only consider the positive integers, odd integers. Now, when we take the positive odd integers for half integral spins, they would be in the classical group, the classical Lie groups, S, L, 2, N. And it is, it is natural. You, you would, we would always find out that the S, L, 2, N is always giving us fermions because of the even nature and because it's, it's linked it is linked to the um, Dinkins root system d capital dn so what is spin uh, o of z of 2 that's um, that's the spin group i guess right spin of z of 2 like yeah that's a that, spin yes. group so right i mean that i think so I take the Lie algebra of the spin half, mm -hmm. then where my integer, the spin half behaves. Oh, these are Lie algebras. I'm sorry, these aren't groups. These are Lie algebras. Yes, they are Lie algebras, yes. So where my spin Z of two, where my Z is an odd integer, I get a fermion because of the half nature. It only happens for odd integers. So now what's going to happen is that we're going to get booted out and we're going to all um, join again using the same link for a second session, okay? Just use the yes. very same link. Um, yes. So over here, I think it will be more clear when I look at this side. When we look at the Lie algebra or the, the Lie group level, when we... I'm learning things that I will later be able to teach people. And my skills at learning are improving and my skills at teaching are gonna improve. And that's what I'm getting here with this uh, participation. And the Patreon support is making this so easy for me to, to do. Maybe if you could review what is a spin group, I think that's, I mean, a spin algebra, right? Because that's a Lie algebra. Okay. Okay. So let me try to review that. So for, okay, so over here, hello. Okay, or, or I'm, maybe, I'm listening. Maybe we'll wait uh, for John to hear that just because any other questions for Francis or comments? Ryan, do you have, a, or Jerry, do you have a question or comment? I was wondering if the spin group had any relationship to uh, some sort of braid group, perhaps? Okay, yes. The spin groups are half, they are power statistics, and power statistics are just. Um, canonical transformations, which are half algebras. So, they so, call them so say that, say, repeat that, please. Could you repeat that? The, the spin groups are some sort of canonical transformations. That is a power statistics. And every power statistics comes <laughs> from a half algebra or something that we call the power half algebra, according to H.S. Green. 
These are so, what kind of statistics? Power statistics? Para statistics. Oh, para, para statistics. Para, para, yeah. para statistics. Para okay. statistics. Yeah. I see. Which means and, that they're in between. These, uh, they're in between fermion statistics and boson statistics, right? Absolutely. It's something kind yes, of. Yes, and they have a half structure. They have a half structure, a half algebra structure, mm. because of their canonical transformations. So, these half structures are modules. And so far as they are modules, they, they can be graded groups. So in, in advanced physics, we have particles that are fermions behaving like Robin braided groups. And this is true and it, it works very true because of quantum chromodynamics. So for you to be a, a, a particle, you would have to be a half algebra, which obey the canonical transformations of HS Green, that's the power statistics, boson, Einstein statistics. And you would also have to be a Clifford algebra. And then from this, you should have a Riemannian manifold. So when you have a Riemannian manifold, we will check if you are smooth, you are injective, if you are smooth and you have an inverse, if your group structure is smooth and you have an inverse, then you are a spindly group. So just, just running after you. <laughs> so this, okay. what I'm reading above, it's saying that the spin is, a, the CL plus is the is a even uh, part of the Clifford algebra. Is that right? Yes, yes. Which means... Um, which means I forget. What is it? There's the even part, there's the odd part. Okay, these are the even parts and they are invertible. For, for the, the images X belonging to this algebra must be invertible. And such in such a way that when we look at the octonormal basis that transforms to form this, it has to be a rotational, a spherical rotational for it to be a spin. because we would be looking at how to consider the differential forms of these. So for as a well, just, and I, I apologize spin, for my stupidity. So CL plus again uh, would be, uh, you have a Clifford algebra. What is the yes. even part? The even part would be, um, and the versus the, the odd the, part. Yes. Oh, is it symmetric and asymm anti-symmetric? Is that how it works or not? I forget. Okay, for Clifford algebras, um, we, we can have symmetry in them, but for it to be able to behave the way we want it to behave, we consider the Clifford algebras over the reals. And this, the elements of this group must be invertible in such a way that when we find the exponential of it, we would have just the results that we have, the sigma summation of y n over n factorial. And when no, we but I'm just pressure, asking a simple a question. Of... What does CL plus mean? I forget what CL plus means. The, the, Clif the, the, the even form of the Clifford algebra. And what is the even form? I guess I'm trying to, I apologize. The I'm even sure. form. How, how would I, okay, let me try to explain. You have a previous slide. Form. I mean, this it's is horrible. That, this is... Yes, these are canonical transformations. So we are looking at transformations from oh, the Even degrees uh, of T of M. Yes, with even degrees. I see. Yes. Oh, okay. So a Clifford algebra has all these generators, and then the generators are building yes. up things that could possibly have bazillions of, I mean, you know, many, many degrees. But you can separate Absolutely. the even degrees and the odd degrees. And then the even degrees. And the odd degrees. If you have even degrees of terms, if the terms have even degree, then when you multiply them together, they stay even degree. That's right. Whereas Absolutely. odd degree doesn't have that. Odd degree is um, Absolutely. odd degree is it's not subalgebra, so to speak. Yes. But the even degree yes. is a subalgebra. Okay. Absolutely. I'm sorry for yes. for um, no problem. Being so still prepared. Mm -hmm. And so this is yes. keeping it stable. That's saying that these things, these even degree ones, are keeping stable the vector space under yes, they make the vector space stable under transformation. Yes. Then when we take
Did you freeze or did something happen? Yeah, I think he's frozen. Okay, we'll get him back. How is this going? Are we hanging in there? <laughs> Who yeah, I mean, understands? It's, nice. it, it's, it's, I'm incrementally understanding more and more. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot here. I mean, I'm, I'm a baby Lee algebraist. And um, so my, I mean, there's a lot of vocabulary, a lot of, you know, I'm not familiar with a lot of the objects. So it's, it, I have to sort of take it for granted, I have to take it as it's given, you know, right. Uh, verbatim. Um, I can't what, really what, think what, about what, this critically that much, but I, I'm seeing where the, I'm seeing where the moving parts are at least. Um, and the, the part that struck me, well, I guess uh, one of the parts was the decompositions that he talked about, you know, basically right. like, uh, kind of like the Grand Schmidt process lets you decompose. Yes, that's the, a, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that gives the octagonalization. Right. Okay, so I'm we're we're you know we're we're learning another five percent here, maybe two percent there. So we're hanging in with we're trying well, to. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of parts. There, there's a lot to it, but um, yeah, they just continue. I mean, it, it every oh. it's okay. So with a spin with a. Oh no. We are frozen again. And for those who don't know, Francis is in Ghana. So we're, uh, he's attends the university in Benin. Uh, it's a special institute for mathematical physics. <laughs> and he's looking for a postdoc. The, the, the so Oriented we, Manifold. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, if there's a question. So the question was, what's a spin group? And I think uh, you were, you kind of had that defined there. Um, and then, of course, we're working with a spin Lie algebra. That's a... yes. So that that is from in in the geometric form. The spin groups are just compact dimensional Lie groups. That is the geometry. So that is where the spin group in mathematics ends. But for a particle, it doesn't end there. For a particle, it moves on. That is where we consider the Lie algebra, and we we come to consider the these limits for for the spin. We say that any spin particle Lie algebra admits a Clifford algebra. So you should first admit a Clifford algebra, and it should have a spin group structure. Then, the second thing is any spin group of a spin particle admits an almost complex spin manifold and a spin Lie group structure. So what we mean by almost complex is we are talking about pseudo Riemannian manifold, some form of um, Kali-Hali manifolds because of the nature of the particles, because they are para statistics. Then from there, we can say that the, the, the particle, the Lie algebra of the particle is a spin Lie algebra. So this is how the spin Lie algebra came about. The spin Lie group, sorry, came about. If there's no questions, I can wait before moving up to, moving on to this preposition. I, uh, can yeah, I yeah, ask no. a random question real quick? Oh, okay, okay, sure. Do you have any uh, references, like good references I could read about parafermi algebras? Parafermi algebra, okay, yes. The, 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 this paper is published in um, Springer. I, I can share the link with you later on, but when, when you, you check group algebraic characterization of spin particles, it has been published with, um, with the Advanced Journal of Clayford Algebra, uh, a Springer Affiliated Journal, yeah. What was it, group characterization of? Of spin particles, group algebraic characterization of spin particles. Or perhaps when, when you type um, my first two names, you should see it on the internet. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Found it. Okay. I think you can move on now. Um, 
So that that's very interesting that the spin uh, structure submitted. that's very interesting that the spin structure sits between the special linear group and the special orthogonal group, right? Uh, okay. In the first map, are these simply inclusions, or this is a what kind of maps are these? Or these are absolutely yes, yes. So just inclusions. So they, they always sit within the special linear form can just be gotten when we complex the SL the special linear groups. Yes. And so this says if they're inclusions, it says that the special linear group in a sense is smaller than the special orthogonal. Is that correct or? Hello, please. Hi. The yeah, because they're inclusions, again? it says that the special linear group is smaller than the special orthogonal group. Is that correct? The special linear group is smaller than the special orthogonal group. Hmm. Okay. I, I have I've I've have not yet verified that. Um, the special linear group smaller than the special well in some group. in some sense, but it's included in the special orthogonal. Is that correct? Yes, because out of the special of um, linear group, you, you could get the special octagonal group depend, depending on Catan list. Actually, when I looked at the way Catan and Helgasen treated the classical groups, um, they, they, they have a way they include it, looking at their homotopics and cohomologies and how they, 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 they work. So that's something for us to think about when we have the talk we're looking forward to that you could give on SL2. And yes. uh, maybe one uh, one uh, thing that I will say though is that uh, slowly we can start thinking about this study group. I'd like to lead it on the mathematics of divisions of everything, which just includes you know many, many things that you are uh, very expert on, um, including SU2, uh, all the uh, Lee theory. Um, where where we'd be heading towards Bacteriosity, but one of the things I was thinking was, I could, um, you know, we could do yes. this every other week, but okay, and this would be on the graduate student level, basically. What you know, what we're okay. doing, that, that, but I could do something on the high school level. So we have people who okay. are more on the high school level, and so in a week I could do a talk on SU2 that relates it to the quaternions that, you know, just shows the matrix form, just so people have a little bit of understanding, like what's a complex number, what's a complex matrix. I don't know if you were there. So we could do that in one week. And then in two weeks, we could have the graduate uh, group um, meet together because I think it'd be interesting that, to bridge in. That, and that so if the, if the high school level people, come to the high school level explanation, they would be allowed to sit in on the graduate student level yes, presentation. That, that is okay. Yeah, okay, That's we'll okay. do that. That's okay. So, so I've got, I yes. got a couple of general questions that are um, um, maybe a little bit apart from the talk. and Because again, there's a lot of moving parts in the talk that I, I think I would, it, it would take me some investment to absorb and and okay. uh, you know, I, I I certainly welcome those kinds of opportunities, but uh, it seems like <laughs> since you're since you're here, Francis, I you know okay. I have some vexing questions um, okay. about physics um, that are more a little more general and and certainly related to things that you talked about in your talk. One is that you talked about the Hamiltonian. Um, yes, and I'm also a big advocate of the Hamiltonian. Like, if you don't have a dynamical system, yeah. a dynamical foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like th talking about things like spin and other other kinds of measurements um, that would relate to self adjoint matrix self adjoint operators uh, is not quite legitimate. I mean, to me, for example, when I see developments of spin, they always talk about the poly matrices as being yes the, the basic self adjoint um, operators that. That you know whose eigen uh, vectors are the spin states of a of, say a spin one half system, um, but where's the Hamiltonian? So to me, <laughs> talking about that before you talk about the Hamiltonian is premature. This is part of my cognitive dissonance learning this stuff. So I'd rather, even though it's more difficult talking mm -hmm. about say a magnetic field and talking about the Hamiltonian. Yeah. 
of a spin one half particle in a magnetic field. To me, that's more legit starting from that point of view and talking directly about spin. Spin is a byproduct absolutely of the, of the dynamics of that system. So I, I'm I'm sort of an advocate for when we're talking about quantum systems, we mm -hmm. always start with a Hamiltonian. Um, yes. So I'm so anyway, I, I'm just saying that uh, that that was something in your talk that really resonated with me. That you know, from a from a, uh, a pedagogical point of view, I I think it's a mistake approaching spin systems without talking about the Hamiltonian first, even though it's so, it's a little more difficult. You know, it does it does add add uh, more layers of difficulty. It seems like it's more physical talking about the way spin one half particles are going to act in a magnetic field and then take it out of your basis. In other words, okay. two ways it can go is therefore it's a two state system. And therefore, how do you model a two state system? How does the magnetic field relate to a two state system? There's a mismatch there. And so SU2 mitigates that mismatch. To me, I'd rather approach it that way. I guess coming from where I am, that seems more, more legit. Anyway, you know, uh, so I'm looking forward to Andrus's talk about SU2 and then and then um talking to you more about about just the physics of spin systems mm -hmm. okay the, so the other question I have <laughs> is very different yes. it's about general relativity <laughs> and to me there's always been this dissonance in in relativity um and that in general relativity you set up a, a you know, there's a, a mass, what is that called? It's called the stress energy momentum tensor or whatever that, that basically captures um, the the amount of mass energy uh, in, a, in a certain region of space. And, there, and that, that then uh, has, has an effect on the, the geometry of space-time. Yes. So the Einstein equation um, makes that connection. My problem with that is that that also speaks for the other forces. In other words, it's not like an independent force where, because for example, electromagnetic field is propagating through that region of space, will then react to that, that distortion of space time. So it's more like a meta force or something. Like I've, I, I've never quite untangled that. Like, do you have a way of thinking about that where the, the gravitational force is not independent of the other force. In particular, the other forces are not independent of the gravitational force because they're going to react to the the, the geometry of the space-time that results Absolutely. from that gravitational field. I mean, is there other are there other examples in physics, for example, with the weak force or the electromagnetic force or the or the or the strong force where one creates the context for the other? Um, in other words, like if you have an electromagnetic field propagating in a, yes. in a say a strong field propagating, will they do they interact in, in some kind of a, a way that's akin to say the electromagnetic field interacting with the gravitational field? Mm -hmm. Or is the gravitational field distinguished in that manner? Is the gravitational field more like a meta field? So that's that's my question for you. I, uh, this okay. untangling is something that's uh, this this tangling up is always something that's, that's bothered me. Okay. W what I have gathered over the years of researching into gravity and fields, I I, I have been able to understand that um, for experimental physicists, they look at these um, effects of gravity on other fields they can consider the, the gravity and they can also neglect it depending on the, the type of experiment they perform. But um, in reality, when we are on Earth, as far as the Earth is uh, the main point of focus and we are not talking about any other space or outside the Earth, gravity can never be done away with. We would have to still deal with gravity. Everything that we would do would include the effects of gravity. So I, I believe the point that you are making that um, if we consider equations that are of 
of um, Einstein's form, then we would have to look at a way that gravity will also play a role in, which, which is very true. I, I believe that statement. Yes. So, so that makes it that makes it seem to me that gravity is not is not an equal footing with the other forces. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Yes. Right. And and for your first question on the Hamiltonian, yes, I on the spin talking about the spin and the dynamical systems. It's true. The Hamiltonian uh, comes from dynamical systems, which is very true. But I, I am looking at um, the effect of this dynamical system. That is, when when looking at the uh, both both statistics, both condensed both statistics and the Fermi Dirac statistics. Yes, they all came from these parallel statistics operators, and this has been dealt with according to dynamical systems. Their Hamiltonian has been dealt with when they look at their energy levels. When you look at my theorem that um, I did on the general decomposition of any particle, you notice that the, the proof of the theorem was specifically for um, an electron. I looked at the proof of that theorem using an electron, and I considered the dynamical system of an electron when it is in a ball, in a ball magneton. And from there, I was able to deduce that the decomposition that I had obeys just what we call the um, Pauli's exclusion principle, which says that no two electrons can stay in the same atom. And we, this is very true because when we talk, when we look at the compact matrix of the electron, the compact form of the electron, we have the cos squared theta um, plus the sine squared theta. And the cos squared theta, sine squared theta in, in trigonometry is just one. And when we also take the usual form of the Pauli matrices. He looks at the trace or the, the, the trace of the energy. He, he considered the determinants of the energy, taking the modulus of the um, psi squared plus the modulus of the uh, beta squared, giving us one. And this is just the effect of um, the, the effect of the trigonometric um, rule that we have called square theta plus sine square theta equals one, which is the compact subgroup of the decomposition I did. Now, the reason why I added the fine structure constant is because of the effect of energies. We know particles in nature have, can either interact based on strong interactions uh, or based on some electromagnetic field. So when we look at any general particle, it will have some sort of translational energy. And this translational energy can be a Planck's constant or a fine structure constant. The, the, there is always a case that in, in mathematics, we do neglect the effects of these coefficients, thinking they are very um, classical. So we can deal with the matrix form, the special linear, special unitary. But in physics and in experiments, I think neglecting a coefficient will be disastrous because when we, we have even the, from the core data calculation analysis, the fine structure constant is one out of 137. That is one divided by 137. And these, um, structure still has decimal points, changing decimal points that are recurring. It has recurring and also changing decimal point to infinity. We, we still don't have the exact form. So I think they behave just like the transcendental numbers, that's the exponential and the pi in mathematics. Just that physicists have not been able to sit down to give it a, a fixed um, value, which makes it a bit difficult. And the only thing that I see helping with this is the proof of Professor Michael Atiyah, the late Atiyah, who conjectured that um, it is possible to have the Hamiltonian to behave like the I in complex numbers. And I am reading very well into the number theory of that to see how I can prove that the fine structure constant is transcendental. That, that, that is a work in progress too. I, I saw a talk um, I think in the last 10 years by Atia, where he was talking about that, that, yes. that, that spin, he thinks that spin structures, um, or, 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 or he called them, he called them spinner structures or yeah, the spinner structures. In, uh, akin, uh, to complex numbers, but we haven't quite wrapped our collective minds around them yet. Um, yes. and that when we do, we'll see that there's a whole, um, 
very rich and, and powerful way of looking at them like much like it took us 100 or 200 years to come to grips with well more than that to come to grips with complex it's true. yeah it's true. So, inter interesting how that relates um jerry do you have um you had questions before on that page 46 47 were they answered or not i think i kind of got us on a tangent uh, no no they they were answered uh let me just say that, that my understanding and take on this, and I, I hear the words and the, the different kinds of mathematical objects and what you're talking about. Uh, I go back on the foundations approach as to looking at when we, when we talk about a group or an algebra and we use the notation of zero matrix of a zero, a one, a minus one, and we introduced this notion of i equal to the square root of minus one as a number. It seems to me that at the very foundational level, we're making some mistakes there because I can't see any kind of real world physical understanding as to what i as a square root of minus one be, would be. I have a lot of difficulty understanding what a minus one is. Uh, mathematically, it makes a lot of sense that I can see it. But in the real world, it's like minus two cows. What do you have? And so when you start talking about language, I can see it's like if, if you have a matrix, which is a boundary, uh, you could express things in terms of zero, one, and minus one. Like you could do a quaternion basis element with four by four matrices, which don't use I. They just use one, zero, and minus one. So you can the nature of the language that we're using to formulate a description of what a Lie algebra is, what a particle is. Uh, so maybe maybe I would speak to maybe I would speak to that uh, just myself, and then maybe Francis or John would speak more. But one of the things that the complex numbers are modeling is this idea of twins. So the crucial thing about complex numbers is that um, I doesn't really pair with minus I. It's really like I and J, you see? It's like two identical twins. And if you call one of them Ian, then the other one cannot be called Ian. The other one will have to be called Joe, let's say, right? But Ian and Joe could have been applied the opposite, you see, because they're identical twins. You could have called either one either way. So it's really confusing, uh, and I didn't figure this out until I got my PhD, but negative I is a very unhelpful way to think of it because it's it kind of says, oh, one of them is primary, the other one is secondary. Mm -hmm. It's completely false. They're actually both identical twins, but uh, when you label one, you need a name for the other one. Now, mathematically, it turns out it's convenient you know, to call negative one, but it would be much more accurate to say it's I and J, let's say, right? That they and you can and then so when you take the complex conjugate, what you're doing is you're swapping J and I, saying that we're just going to change the names. But so this idea of modeling two things that are the same in every single way, except that they're not the same. <laughs> see, right? You know, like two electrons, for example. Two electrons are the same in every single way, except that they're not the same electron. This one. If you give a name to this one, then you'll have to give a different name to that one. Does that make sense? So just from a modeling point of view, like that becomes a, this, this is a math that allows you to model things like that. And it turns out, so for example, where, why is complex numbers more uh, basic than real numbers? Because complex numbers, you can model counting forward and counting backward. You see, there's a duality between counting forward and counting backward. And that duality is exactly this type of identical twins. You see that counting forward and counting backward, there's absolutely no difference. It's just you choose which direction will be forward, and then the other one will be backward. So complex numbers have that kind of built into the way they're coded, that they have that duality. That's why in, when you look at Lie theory, the unitary group is the plain vanilla one. The plain vanilla Dinkin diagrams, like the special linear and the unitary, that's complex numbers. Then either you fold it and you get the quaternions, so you're doubling yeah. it, or you cut it, and then when you cut it, you'll get two versions. Either you'll you'll need to have like a 
basically you cut it and say, okay, I'm going to take the forward direction and glue it to the backward direction. And when you glue it, either you need to add an extra zero or you need to fuse them, you know, to say like, so when you've added an extra zero, you'll have like a, it's kind of like in history where you have AD and BC, you know, how do they come together? We don't have a year zero, but that would have been a solution, you know, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three. Another solution would be minus three, minus two, minus one equals one, minus one and equals one could be fused together, then two, three, four. So that would be like odd and even orthogonal matrices. And orthogonal matrices, the real case, you need two by two matrices, kind of like what you were saying. If you have an extra dimension, you have a dimension that can't have a rotation. It's just going to have to be fixed in some dimension. So now the other alternative is when you do the quaternions, you can double it. You can fold everything. Then you're going to multiply by two. That's the one we use. It goes negative three, negative two, negative one, one, two, three. And there's like four ways that you could uh, mix that up. Uh, so maybe that's not a very clear, but it's saying that actually is a very, very basic, uh, super basic thing, this identical twins. Yeah, I I. I... Noted the end of uh, Francis's talk where you talked about that sort of stuff and uh, trying to translate that back into what I consider to be the real world, where you have male and female instead mm -hmm. of identical twins. And, and how do you deal with that? So I tend to view the quaternion as the most fundamental number. The complex numbers are factored out of that. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then you see as to what is the meaning in it involves boundary math how you establish boundaries and, and so, versus and, boundaries and in time i want to jump in because that's what john and francis were talking about with the hamiltonians the hamiltonians mm -hmm. are pairing uh, momentum and position the hamiltonians right. are based on the symplectic uh, lee theory the symplectic lee theory is the one that does that folding because you're taking position and you're saying, oh, we'll also look at momentum. And so then they're going to be kind of running in pairs, position and momentum. So it's actually very, and so your fourfold structure is compatible to this whole notion of Hamiltonian. And also this idea that maybe I just want to add an idea um, that there could be something contradictory about uh, gravity where it's, it's, that's what makes it the meta field. So I've been looking at the landscape of truth um, and the idea is that there's this landscape of truth that's the state of contradiction. It can, you know, God can be contradictory anywhere. But what humans are trying to do when they have their access point to truth is they're trying to constrain the contradiction. They're trying to localize the contradiction to a singularity. So everything's consistent except for truth as a judge, you know, or truth as a metaphor, or truth as a commander, or truth as a view, or truth as an outcome. So in physics, maybe that's the idea is that Gravity is what allows for a singularity, you see. So every particle is a singularity. We just don't talk about it. But it's a singularity with regards to gravity. And so gravity is what allows for that contradiction to be contained, constricted, but it also allows for particles to exist as contradictory beings, because they are. Okay, let, let me just come into there a little bit. You're talking about the, the truth and the value. Now, this is where I have a real problem with the notion of the metric the distance function of some sort, if you're going to have a manifold as to what is, what is the distance between two ideas? What is the distance between tooth and value? What is the distance between conscious entities as opposed to organizations of quantum consciousness entities? And this, I think, comes back to the ultimate foundation about how we're going to talk about language, about math, and then to physics and biology and, and all the social problems and all that sort of stuff. So, it's, it's back to there. If, if you're talking about truth, then how do you talk about a metric? Yeah, so is a metric there, doesn't have to be about distance. It could be a topology. Okay. You can have a topology. Yeah. It could be know. a neighborhood, a house off type of thing. Yeah, I, I, that's very different than a metric space. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't think I, I there's think, a metric space, but... Mm -hmm. Okay, I think with Prof, I can come in here. Is it the idea of language and... Um, mathematics is quite broad you know nature gives us a lot of problems to be able to think about and see how um, the universe came into existence and how we also came into existence i i believe that um in biology when people tell me that the division of cells i start getting so 
chaotic because division of cells in mathematics, I know division is a particular rule that is obeyed and I don't see that division in the biology, but you hear division of cells and it becomes very complicated for some of us to understand. In, in, in the field in the um, field that you spoke about, that um, looking at the distance between ideas and truth and all those things. And these are quite um, difficult concepts to, uh, con to, to give a definition to in terms of uh, reality. In, in the field of mathematics, the language is very, very unique and it has been well created. I think mathematics in Africa is the same everywhere in the world, in Asia, in Europe, everywhere in the world. But when it comes to biology, it is the same, but the language differs and it becomes very difficult to understand. But yeah. if I count to you and I tell you that today is 23rd, even in my language, I can write two and three, 23. I write the figure you would be able to understand it is 23. And it makes maths very unique. But biology and other sciences has not been developed quite the same. Because the language differs in every country. And even in the country, we have various language in one country. So it makes it quite complicated. I think God, if he would have been anything, would have been a mathematician. Yes. Yeah. Well, this, this, this comes back to uh, the notion that I say often that, that nature doesn't do the math but nature gets the right answer. And what I mean by that is it doesn't do the math that we do, the, the way that we do math. But Absolutely. I think there is some kind of understanding of math or language that generates math that underlies that. And I, I have this sense that the quaternion, quaternion structure is deeply involved with that. So then yes. how do you go? And this, I think, comes back to art. And you take Andreas, who is the mathematician and an artist. So that's an unusual uh, combination in a sense as to how does he make decisions for an artistic judgment. So my artistic of, judgment sure. is that we have 20 seconds. So we're going to do another reboot. We, we won't probably talk for too long, but we'll talk about our study group, okay? Because that's okay. what, this was been, has been very fun, we must say, so when we're getting to become quite friendly. So yeah. we have <laughs> 10, nine, eight, seven, <laughs> six, five, four, Three, two, one. Um, so what we'll do is we'll talk about the, uh, we seem pretty happy. We'll talk about the study group, when to set it up. Uh, yeah. And then. Um, yeah, I, I apologize for my naivete in terms of mathematical formalism and stuff, but I, I've spent a lot of time looking at it, but it, it is from a, a real foundational level. And then it goes back to my experience where I'm out in the real world where I'm wearing boots and I use shovels and I'm dealing with all kinds of crazy biology. Mm -hmm. And it's not there. Chemistry is there in a very mm -hmm. real sense and mathematics to some extent is, but if I'm looking at worms or fish, I don't see the, I don't, you don't see the math. You don't see what? You don't see I what? I don't see the math. In words and in, in, in fish, I see. Yeah, that, that they're not, using math that I can recognize in any way, shape, or form, but yet I have a, a sense of an underlying unity of the universe that language is involved with that. And I can see language in biology, the genetic code, um, neurotransmitters, all of that. Well, okay, so one of the one of the things, like the, the math that I was doing was the basement of math. It's algebraic combinatorics. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just simply how you like permutations, you know, or just how you, you know, how you have different objects arise. Uh, so Francis is with us, we've started. Uh, and so the question is, uh, you know, where does math come up in the real world? But one of the places like in quantum physics, when we look at the solutions to the Schrodinger's equation, orthogonal polynomials come up. And the idea for me, at least, is that that's not a physicist's tool. That's not a mathematician's tool. That's the language of nature that nature is yeah. um, c communicating with these orthogonal polynomials and they have combinatorial meaning. And if you listen to that, you can see the language that nature is using and decode it. But physicists don't believe that nature has something to say. So they just completely don't do that. So, but I, I've been working on that. We'll be having um, our study group. will take a look at that. Uh, what are the combinatorial objects, which were very simple. Like in the case of the quantum harmonic oscillator, it's just saying, if you have, let's say, seven points, how could, let's say, four of them be paired up with yeah. links and three of them not? 
See, that's the kind of thing, like, so these little links between, th which is like these identical twins, basically, right? Like you have two sets of identical twins and the other three are not. And how many ways can you do that? Can you use this when you're doing your artwork? Uh, I could, I could, I have not yet, but that's a good idea. You're, oh. you're an, well, your wife that, is an artist, is that right? Though, Lynn is an, and those birds in back, those are Lynn's yeah, no, they're, statues, they're right? Her. Okay, okay. I live in a gallery. Yeah, I have a, just a quick, uh, quick comment. Um, Jerry, I, I gave a talk at my college a couple of years ago on why are complex, you know, what are complex numbers and why are they useful? And if you want, I could, I could give that talk again. It's, it 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 goes through a little bit of the history of complex numbers, and um, it's sort of complex numbers from the point of view of of what they are mathematically, you know, uh, and and also why they're useful, you know. And, and to me, that's a large part of my experience of mathematics is, you know, is familiarity. In other words, using it and becoming familiar, and then it becomes kind of more intuitively intrinsic but only after you experience it uh you know for example tensors you were saying that you don't like the tensor formulation of general relativity and i don't either because it looks messy but <laughs> if you worked with it if you worked with it day in day out for several weeks or months yeah it sort of become intrinsic and then and then it it becomes uh maybe you don't like i i'm unlike andrews i I'm more experiential when it comes to mathematics rather than understanding the philosophical foundations, but it does become intuitive after you after you use it enough. And yeah. and so this is this talk is just like a plausibility talk for why you would be interested in using complex numbers. Like where where did they arise and why you know why did people favor them? Um, so, so could we could that be a math for wisdom talk that we could yeah, record? Okay. I could do that, yeah. I've got and then, topic. so why don't we do that? Uh, like, for example, I think I'll do one on SU two next time, and then we'll yeah. have Francis do on the graduate student level SU two okay. for us, you know. And then, uh, if you could do, a, you know, we'll alternate. But then, if you could do your complex talk one time, you know, no, it could yeah, almost even great. be next week. We'll decide like what to do. Yeah. Well, so maybe um, what I want to ask. Yeah. Uh, for the study group, is this like a good time for everybody? Uh, it's okay for around me. the world. I'm pretty flexible now. We... You're pretty flexible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what day of the week is best for you, Francis? Is Tuesday fine or Monday or what? Okay, for for now, um, I'll, I'm a bit um, uh, indecisive because I'll be relocating um, in two weeks. There is a possibility I may relocate to India, so oh, I'm, wow. I'm I'm looking at. That's that's okay. for postdoc or for what or for 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 um, teaching I for mathematics teaching but for college level. Oh, so, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I've, have a I've, job I've opportunity. Done, mm -hmm. Yes, I've done some other postdocs, but I've not heard from them. So I want to take some opportunities to work for a while. Very yeah. good. Okay, so you may be traveling. So we may need to postpone that SU2 for like four weeks. Is that better? Yes. That is better. Okay, that we will better. postpone. There's no rush on this. Also, like I'm in the middle of this whole um, right. scholarship workshop. It's crazy. So, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. but so why don't we just slow it down? Um, maybe in, so maybe what we could do with John, uh, this is what I propose. Why don't in two weeks, John give his talk on the complex numbers. We'll start with that. Yeah, that'd be great. In yes, three be weeks, great. I'll give a talk on SU2. And then in okay. four weeks, you will take us to the graduate student level. That's the plan, you know, when you're ready, when you're settled. Is that fine? Yeah, that, that is better. But yeah, basically, but basically, like this time zone is okay, I think, right? Or I mean, this type I of... I think from, uh, from Ghana to India, we have... Um, Six hours difference. So I, I think I would have. That'll be eleven o'clock at night, right? No, that that's, sounds too late. But, but it could be earlier. It could be nine o'clock. It could be ten o'clock at night. Is it could be late? ten or nine, which would be okay. Uh, that moves okay for me. Nine o'clock yeah. in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning would work for you, John, or? Uh, eight eight o'clock is kind of a stretch, but um, unfortunately, nine o'clock in the morning, two weeks from now, I've got I've got an appointment, so I won't be able to do it. No, we'll 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 do that. But just in general, so okay. So the whole point is is that uh, we Francis is the key person uh, for our group, and when Francis's schedule becomes apparent, this study group will start uh, 
the hardcore graduate student level will start in four weeks. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, Francis doesn't have to come to the lower yeah. level. You know, he Francis, can go we're going to be we're going to be twelve time zones apart if you move to I India. Oh, okay, um, that that is okay. That's, yeah, so that'll be okay. So second. nine o'clock in California would be nine o'clock at uh, India. Or nine and a half. I think they're half an hour off or something mm -hmm. funny like that. Okay. Is that okay? So then that's settled. Um, any any other? Um, and then of course uh, with Jerry, I'd love to do an interview. Uh, you know, when we'll, one we exchange some more letters, and then we could do an interview um, about you and your research, right? Uh, yeah. to present no, I've, I've got a lot of response to me for what you've said here so far. So we'll, we'll be. Yeah, and I, maybe I'll complete the reading then. I'll complete the reading okay. and then um, that you've given, and in, so in a couple of weeks maybe we'll um, we'll yeah. have a. Yeah, it's Ryan. Ryan, what are your impressions of all this? How, how what have you what have you uh, to say? Um, it was nice to be here. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> Francis, on your PhD. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And I look forward to studying with you all. When yeah, when are uh, you defending, Francis? Or did you defend already? Not yet. I have not been given a date. Okay. I am still waiting for the university. But you've written all your thesis. Your, 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 your I've submitted, submitted my thesis. work. Everything. Yeah, everything is submitted. And you have the my party thesis, shirt. So, so you're my, all set. My thesis was on, was on cleft Gordon coefficients. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. So would that be another talk? That's another talk. Yes, that, I, I, that, that would be great. I have even a paper I gave a talk at um, Springer, that mm -hmm. was three, two, three weeks ago. That is on um, periodic integrals of spin nice. particles. Yeah. That, sounds that sounds really exciting. intense. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so so sure. when you're settled in, you know, into India, then we will start. Um, yes, exploiting yes. your but, knowledge. But in, in I think next week by next week um, Friday. I'll mm -hmm. let you know if I will be there or not. Okay. Because I, I have several of us I'm considering too. So I'm looking at other things. Yeah. Okay. So any maybe uh, so a huge thank you to Francis. Uh, this is a huge opportunity for us to have this uh, study group and to have uh, Jerry with us, uh, opening up gigantic realms of biology, life, uh, consciousness and uh, language and uh, udu do. Is that, is that how I say it, udu do? Or? Odo do. Huh? Odo do. Odo do, okay, odo do, that's right, odo do. Um, it's not really okay. a speaking language, but it is a guidance document. And so maybe who would, or maybe Jerry would say a prayer just to, con I mean, that's something I like to do is, you know, we have so much good energy and, that there's a source of that energy or there's a something that can receive that energy. Because what do we do with all this energy? Something that would receive it and give it back, you know, this energy bank. So um, I don't know how you pray or how you think, but uh, is there um, a word that you could end us with? Uh, but I just want, before we do that, I just want to thank Francis for his talk, for his fellowship, his friendship, for his leadership, his scholarship, uh, that, uh, it really opens up for me. This study group is something that I want to pursue with. And it's a kind of like, I have a very clear idea of like the kind of things I'd like us to be learning, but I have the idea of like, as a leadership, I'd like us to be leaders in expanding our minds. Uh, math is such a hard thing. And I think we can, uh, we can, we can uh, absorb it together. Okay. That, that's great. Uh, any, any closing words by anybody? And then we'll ask Jerry to conclude us uh, in the great absolute. Uh, then Jerry, please. Uh, I really don't do prayer. I, I have a sense of a universal consciousness that we're all connected. So I would just say thank you. I'm delighted to meet all of you. And I look forward to uh, lots of conversations going forward. And I think we all have a chance to really save the world and it needs it. Okay, thank you too. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all. It was good oh. to be here. Was, you know, thank you. Nice, nice meeting you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, well. Francis. Thank, thank you, Francis, for, uh, for doing this. You're and, welcome. And, uh, and good luck. Good luck with uh, the, the uh, search for the postdoc and also with your defense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.